So you may be wondering, wow, Finlay, how do you have all this confidence, you know? Such a confident guy. That'll be the one. Dilma confidence tea. What's in it? I don't know, some herbs and spices and stuff. It's nice. Yep, that's my secret. So give it a go, maybe? I don't know. So in addition to tea, I also consume other things such as macronutrients in my diet. Yes, so do you, I hope. Delicious. What are macronutrients? Well, there's three of them. The first one, carbohydrates. Carbs. Pretty sure people have heard of that one before. What is a carb? Very good question. So carbohydrates are the body's main source of energy. Very cool. These are sugar molecules. They look like this. Cyclohexane sort of ring. Very cool. These bad boys should make up about half your diet. Clearly they're quite important. I made a song about it, so enjoy that. Carbohydrate, 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 carbohydrate. Diet like this, I'm getting lean. Here's what I've seen. I love it so much, I'm anti me. Walking so much that I hurt my feet. Yep, hope you loved that. Very cool, very lit. Had my mate Adam on the vocals as well. Wow, what a great song. The second macronutrient are fats. And these should make up maybe around 20 to 35% of your diet. And these are long chain molecules. Just a bunch of carbon molecules pretty much bonded together. There might be the occasional double bond in there. So fats are really good for storing energy. That seems probably quite important. And the third macronutrient is protein. And this should make up about 10 to 35%. Oh, quite a big range. We'll get to that, um, of your diet. So you need these three macronutrients to survive. And that should make up your diet. Okay, very cool. So people love to sell you things and to make you think things like marketing people. They can make people think carbs are bad, sell you low carb products. Mm -hmm. They can make you think that fats are bad, sell you low fat products. Okay, very cool. But what about protein? Mm -hmm. I'm pretty sure that you might have heard that protein's probably good for you. People really love to sell protein powder, protein supplements, all of that good stuff. A good way to make money for them. Mm -hmm. But does that actually matter? Do we need all this extra protein? How much protein do we get? What is protein? So I had a little look into it and found some interesting things. I'm not a dietitian, obviously. <laughs> I have a degree in chemistry. Does that mean anything? Not much. But this is what I found by reading some research papers. So what is a protein? Good question. So a protein is pretty much just like a big old folded up mess. <laughs> really? Wow, look at that. What are those made of? Polypeptides. That is just a long chain of amino acids bonded together. Okay, so if we take it back even further, what is the individual building block that makes up a big protein? An amino acid. Cool, okay. So in a protein, there can be anywhere from like maybe a hundred of these amino acids up to like tens of thousands of amino acids in this single protein. That's a lot of things. Okay, so proteins are made up of amino acids. So what's an amino acid? Let's look at the name. Amino, amine, the NH2 group, that's an amine functionality. Amino, that's on one side. On the other end of the amino acid is the acid part. This is a carboxylic acid. So amino acid comes from the amine group and the acid. Wow, put it together, amino acid. These amino acids come together to form these long polypeptide chains, which then get folded up into this protein. Cool. So you may have noticed that in the middle of the amino and the acid part of an amino acid, there's another group. There's a, there's a carbon in the middle there, and it's got a proton coming off, and also this R group coming off below. So what is this R group? This could be a bunch of different things. It could be a longer carbon chain. It could be some aromatic group. It could be like some other atoms bonded down there. So these different R groups allow you to differentiate between two different amino acids. And there's 20 different amino acids that each have a different R group. So by changing what amino acids you put into your protein and like the order of the amino acids, you're able to change the function of that protein. And it's important that you have all 20 of these amino acid building blocks to be able to build whatever proteins that you wanna build. You can think of the amino acids like tiles on a Scrabble board. Scrabble, very fun, nice. Let's say you wanted to make the word igloo, but you're missing one of the 20 amino acids. Oh no, I'm missing like an I. What's that gonna make? glue. <laughs> Your body can make 11 of these 20 amino acids. Very good. Well done, body. Very smart of you. However, 
it can't make these nine. Oh no. So how do you get these other nine amino acids? Because like, that's a lot of Scrabble tiles you're missing. Can't really make many words, many proteins. <laughs> so these have to come from your diet. And this is what the term essential amino acid comes from, because it's essential, you eat them, you have to get these amino acids from your diet, because you can't make them by yourself. Not the same meaning for essential oils. You do not need to ingest essential oils. They come from the essence of plants. Don't drink essential oils, it's a whole different thing. So to get these nine essential amino acids, you have to eat protein that goes down into your stomach and then from enzymes in there, they do their enzyme things and they break down the protein into the individual amino acid building blocks. And now you've got all these amino acids, they can zoom around to all these parts of your body, make up your muscles, they make up your nails, your hair, they enable vital functions of your organs and immune cells. They're important in making like enzymes and hormones regulatory and transport molecules, a whole bunch of things. But the main function is that they help build your muscle. It's kind of like getting a house, a protein, demolishing it into like the individual bricks. Those are the amino acids and they can get transported to other places and you can build a whole new house, a new protein. I guess it sort of makes sense because you probably don't want like the cow meat proteins that make up their muscles and your muscles. You're not a cow, and maybe you are. Hello, all my cow friends. Wowee. So protein seems quite important then. So how much do we actually need? The recommended daily intake of protein is 0.8 grams per kg of body weight per day. So if you work this out for someone that weighs 70 kgs, this is about 56 grams of protein needed each day. So how did they get this number? It's from looking at the nitrogen balance in our bodies. Because as we saw earlier, protein is the only macronutrient that contains nitrogen. Because fats, just kind of carbon, hydrogen, carbohydrates, also just mainly carbon, hydrogen, some oxygen maybe. But proteins have the amino group. So if you measure how much nitrogen a person excretes, usually from like urea in the urine, maybe also from sweat, other things, and they worked out you need to consume this amount of protein to balance the nitrogen. So you don't want to be in a nitrogen deficit less than this because then you'll start losing muscle. Bye bye muscle. Peace. But in the literature there's actually quite a large range of the amount of protein that they think you should be having. This 0.8 grams is just to balance the nitrogen so you're not gaining or losing any nitrogen from the protein intake. But different factors such as if you exercise and you want to like build muscle get massive okay you're probably going to need a little bit more protein to be able to build the extra muscle so in the literature the range is like from the 0.8 grams per kg per day to about two grams per kg per day so they've determined that within this range is safe and having a bit more protein than that base 0.8 grams per kg per day might be helpful if you want to build some muscle so if we pick a higher number in the middle there somewhere like 1.6 grams of protein per kg of body weight per day for the same 70 kg person, it comes to about 112 grams of protein needed. One of the main reasons why I think there's such a large range is because it doesn't only depend on how much protein you eat, but also when you eat the protein. So there was a study that showed that your body has a maximum speed at which it can build muscles from proteins. As you can see in this graph here, anything more than about 30 grams of protein in a single meal doesn't really result in any more increased muscle. Oh, so any more than this 30 grams in one sitting, that's not gonna help build muscle any faster. So for example, if you sat down for dinner and had like your total 100 grams or whatever of protein in that one meal, it's really not gonna make much difference to the amount of muscle that you can make than if you would've just had 30 grams. So you're better off spreading that 100 grams of protein across the whole day, maybe in three different meals having 30 grams and then maybe another 10 grams in like a snack and this would allow an increased muscle production across the whole day not just in one bit so this is important because after you've done like a workout some resistance training at the gym or something getting massive this enhances the synthesis of muscle protein for up to 24 hours so you don't just want to have one big meal of protein after you do some exercise you want to be able to spread that protein throughout the day so what happens to all that extra protein if you're having 100 grams of protein in one sitting you can only use up to 30 grams for muscle synthesis at one time so what's the other 70 grams of protein going to do so it can go and like do stuff with hormones and 
enzymes and the stuff we talked about earlier, all the fun functions that proteins have, but any of these amino acids that you're not using right away to be building muscle, they're going to be permanently oxidized. You can't get that back. Rot roll. So there's no way to store amino acids in your body. You can't just bulk up on a whole lot of protein and hope that'll last you for like an entire 24 hours. Mm -mm. Nope. Irreversibly oxidized. You can no longer use those amino acids to make more muscle. They're gone. So what are they oxidized into? Like what, what, what happens with them? They can be turned into glucose for energy if you need some extra energy, if you're not getting enough from carbs. Or if they're not used for energy, they can end up being stored as fat. So the process of converting these unused amino acids into like glucose for energy or into fat is through a reaction called deamination. D -amin amino D deamination. Goodbye nitrogen. Bye. So this nitrogen leaves an NH2 group that's not going to stay just NH2 for a while because nitrogen wants to have three bonds. So it's going to pick up just a floating around proton, turn into ammonia, and that is quite toxic. You don't want that just floating around in you. So your kidney has to convert that into urea, which then you can excrete through like your urine. But if your kidney has to do this a lot, it could put some extra strain on your kidney that you don't want if you're having a lot of excess protein in your diet. So how much protein are people actually eating? Too much? Too little? Do we need protein supplements? Do we need protein powder? Like we're being marketed? Hmm? With a normal diet, your average person is already getting more than the recommended daily intake. Wow. There's a few different figures and it varies with like country to country and like different people obviously. But some figures show the average person eats about 1.5 grams per kg of body weight per day, which is a lot more than 0 0.8. <laughs> There's some other figures that show people eat about 88 grams of protein per day. And for the average person, this is still more than the recommended daily intake. Okay, okay, I see. So people are actually eating enough protein. So unless you're like a bodybuilder, they would probably want their protein intake to be up from like the 1.6 to the 2 grams per kg of body weight per day. That sort of vibe. But for the average person, you're getting plenty of protein just in your normal diet. So it seems quite silly to waste your money on like protein supplements or protein powder when you're probably already getting enough. Food is expensive enough as it is. <laughs> Do not need to be paying more. <laughs> so where is all this protein coming from? Mainly meat and dairy products. People love to eat those. Both of these food groups contain a lot of protein and they also have all the nine essential amino acids you need. However, eating lots of meat and dairy products are probably like not the biggest vibe overall because the package of your protein is not as good as it could be. Because if you're eating like lots of meat, in addition to that protein you're getting, you're also going to be getting a lot of saturated fats, which you don't need. And also the meat and dairy industry, probably not the best friends with the environment. Okay, so how could we do better than this? How else could you get some protein? Oh, don't worry, there's other ways. Eating more plant protein is very beneficial. Because firstly, in addition to getting the protein you need, you're also getting lots of vitamins, antioxidants, minerals and fiber, which all are in plants, which you might not find in meat and dairy. Plants in general are better for the environment than having a whole lot of cows. So there's that as well. Sorry to all my cow fans out there. <laughs> so one drawback to plant protein is they may not contain all the nine essential amino acids you need, or maybe some of them are in just like a lower concentration. However, because people already eat over the recommended daily intake of protein, and if you're eating a bunch of different types of plant protein, you'll have plenty of the nine amino acids that you need. So some examples of plant proteins, are legumes, which include beans, lentils, chickpeas, and peas. Sounds delicious. There's also tofu, temper, don't really know what that is. Nuts and seeds are also a good source of protein. And importantly, quinoa is a great plant source of protein. And this actually contains all nine essential amino acids. So quinoa doesn't have the drawbacks that some of the other plant proteins does. Very cool, eat some quinoa. So a great thing about incorporating more plant-based protein into your diet is that you're not only getting the protein from the plants, you're also getting all the other nice nutrients they have. And a great example of this is plants have a lot of fiber in them. Unlike protein, fiber is a nutrient that the average person eats a lot less than the recommended daily intake. Oh, so what is fiber? Technically, it's a carbohydrate, a sugar molecule, but it's a bunch of sugar molecules connected together, usually about 10 or more, 
to form a non-starch polysaccharide. There's two main types of fiber. Soluble fiber can dissolve in the water in your body and insoluble fiber, which can't. Because of the structure of fiber being like a chain of these sugar molecules, it doesn't get digested in your stomach. Ooh, so it passes straight through your stomach and goes into your large intestines. And who lives in your large intestines? Your gut microbiome. Yes, there's a bunch of friendly bacteria there. They're so cool, they're so friendly, they're nice. So when fiber comes to them, they're like, mm-mm-mm, delicious, thank you so much. I can turn this into some short chain fatty acids. Doing my thing, mm. So a result of having a lot more fiber can increase your cardiovascular health. So you can see there's a nice graph here. Eat more fiber, less chance of having cardiovascular-like diseases. Okay, very cool. It can regulate your blood sugar. It can increase your gut health. You know, your gut microbiome. They're a lot more happier, those guys in there. There's this gut-brain axes. You know, your gut talks to your brain. Your brain talks to your gut. They're quite connected. We don't really know everything about it. There's a cool study that demonstrates this, showing that increased fiber may help reduce depression. Wow, very cool. And another main positive of increasing your fiber is you'll be less constipated. That's sick. I love that. The two types of fiber, there's the soluble, the insoluble. They both have different roles in like lubricating your intestines and, and adding more bulk to your stool. All the good things so you can be less constipated. Hell yeah, that's sick. So in the Western world, the average person needs to increase their fiber by about 50% to get to the recommended intake. So people are quite a way off having the recommended level of fiber, which is, you know, probably quite concerning. Seems a bit more concerning than the protein situation. Definitely getting enough of that, not getting enough fiber. So why isn't the average person getting much fiber? So if we look at the standard American diet, I love how the acronym is SAD. It's very fitting. <laughs> this doesn't have really much fruit or vegetable where a lot of fiber comes from. And also it includes a lot of processed food. And the act of processing food removes a lot of the fiber that's in food. So what can you do about this? What foods have a lot of fiber? As we said, fruits vegetables, also nuts and seeds, legumes and pulses, and whole grains. So therefore, an easy way to increase your fiber is switching from like a white rice or a white pasta to a brown rice or brown pasta, a wholemeal pasta. Wow, how cool. Okay, how fun. It seems like all the things that you can get your fiber from is also a lot of where the plant protein comes from. A double whammy. Hmm. So including more plant-based foods into your diet a flexitarian, what a cool word, <laughs> is looking very slaying right now. You get nice protein and you also increase your fiber. So in conclusion, you can stop worrying about your protein intake. You're probably already getting enough protein in your normal diet. Protein supplement and protein powder companies have put a lot of money into marketing to make you think that you need more protein, but you really probably don't, unless you want to like be a bodybuilder then sure. We saw that having more plant protein is a better package for your protein than like meats because you get a lot less saturated fats and then you also get the added nutrients like the antioxidants and the fiber so if you want to increase anything in your diet you should increase your fiber sl slowly don't do it all at once because you know it could get a bit spicy because most people eat a lot less fiber than the recommended amount very fun very cool nice so overall eating more plants seems like a good vibe is that a surprise? Not really. <laughs> eat less processed food, eat less meat, eat more plants. You'll still have protein and you'll also get all these other nutrients and fiber. Seems like a very nice vibe. Okay. Thanks for that one. <laughs> okay, bye.